Why is it so difficult to get to Ganymede? In the vastness of the solar system, Ganymede, Jupiter's largest moon, presents itself as an intriguing destination full of possibilities for human exploration. With a size that surpasses even the planet Mercury, this moon offers a unique environment that could unlock fundamental secrets about the solar system's evolution and provide crucial resources for humanity in the future. However, no rover or exploration probe has landed on the surface of Ganymede. If Ganymede is such an important natural satellite, why has a space mission never been sent to explore? Is that perhaps it's tough to get to Ganymede? Stay with us to find out. The largest natural satellite of all. Ganymede, with a diameter of about 5,268 kilometers, is the largest moon in our solar system. This colossus is bigger than Earth's moon and surpasses even the planet Mercury in size, giving it an imposing presence in Jupiter's orbit. Despite being a planetary mass moon, Ganymede has less surface gravity than Mercury, Io, or the moon due to its lower density than all three. Its geological structure features a fascinating mix of ice and rock, extensive plains, grooves, and ridges, suggesting a somewhat chaotic geological history. When Pioneer and Voyager probes flew by the satellite in the 1970s, they managed to take images that indicated the presence of impact craters and tectonic structures on the surface, indicating that it was a place with enormous geological riches that could help us better understand the formation of natural satellites and the entire solar system. Initially, the Pioneer and Voyager missions did not have the objective of studying Ganymede since it was not considered an exciting satellite. The objective of these missions was to study the gaseous planets, since at that time very little was known about them. But this changed when scientists analyzed all the data these missions had provided us about Ganymede. The only satellite with a magnetic field Ganymede hosts a unique magnetic field, the only one among the solar system's moons. This magnetic field, presumably generated by the convection of its metallic ice shell at the core, piques the curiosity of scientists and explorers alike. Previously, it was thought natural satellites could not have magnetic fields because they were not large enough to produce them by electromagnetic induction in their cores. Still, between 1995 and 2000, the Galileo spacecraft made six close flybys of Ganymede and discovered that it had a magnetic field independent of the Jovian magnetic field. This discovery caught the attention of astronomers since until then it was not known that a moon could generate a magnetic field like Earth's. Ganymede's magnetic field is unique in that it produces a tiny magnetosphere embedded within Jupiter's magnetosphere. It is a magnetosphere within another magnetosphere, and it is the only moon in the solar system known to possess this characteristic. This implies that Ganymede is protected by two magnetospheres, Jupiter's and its own. So the percentages of radiation perceived on its surface are very low, making Ganymede a potentially habitable place. Thanks to these discoveries, astronomers became much more interested in studying this satellite and decided to point the Hubble telescope to observe it in more detail. This act of curiosity revealed to us that a phenomenon occurs on Ganymede that also occurs on Earth that no one expected to find in a natural satellite. Just as on Earth, the interaction between the magnetic field and solar radiation produces auroras, on Ganymede, the interaction between its magnetosphere and the Jovian plasma coming from Jupiter's magnetosphere produces auroras very similar to Earth's auroras. Using the Hubble telescope to observe Ganymede's auroras in more detail, scientists noticed something odd. Normally, the auroras are produced by the interaction between a body's magnetic field and the radiation coming from the interplanetary medium. However, the behavior of auroras can be modified or distorted by other components in the inner layers, such as, for example, some metals discovered in a vast ocean of liquid water could change the shape of auroras, which could be observed from space. Does it mean that Ganymede could have an internal ocean of water not visible from space? This question got NASA engineers to work and prepare a probe that, among many other goals, would try to find out once and for all if Ganymede had water inside. The mission for this purpose would be the Galileo probe, which took off on October 18, 1989, and arrived on Jupiter on December 7, 1995, after a very long journey of six years. 
Previously, other space exploration probes such as Voyager or Pioneer reached Jupiter in less time, but the Galileo probe was much heavier than the previous ones, weighing 5,640 pounds, while the Voyager and Pioneer probes weighed 1,600 and 560 pounds respectively. Being heavier, a spacecraft can choose two alternatives – use more fuel to reach its destination in less time, or take the time it takes at the cost of not wasting the fuel it has. The Galileo probe did not have large reserves of fuel. In fact, no space exploration mission usually carries a lot of fuel because the more fuel a spacecraft carries, the heavier it will be. The more weight it carries, the more difficult it will be to acquire great speed. The tiny amount of fuel that space missions carry is used to perform redirection maneuvers when they are close to the target. If engineers decide to use that fuel for the spacecraft to reach its destination sooner, once in place, it will not have the fuel to perform maneuvers, so it will be a waste. Before moving on, be sure to like or dislike the video so that we can improve them for you, the viewer. Plus, don't forget to subscribe to our channel by making sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our daily videos. The Largest Water Reservoir in the Solar System In the 1970s, after information provided by the Voyager and Pioneer probes, NASA scientists first suspected that Ganymede might have a thick ocean between two layers of ice, one on the surface and one beneath the liquid ocean and on top of the rocky mantle. When the Galileo probe arrived at Jupiter and flew by Ganymede, the images revealed something impressive. The satellite's auroras exhibited erratic behavior, identical to that predicted by models in which Ganymede was considered to have an internal ocean. Galileo's observations, combined with images from the Hubble Space Telescope, suggest that beneath the outer layer that covers the entire surface of Ganymede is a large ocean of salt water that affects the satellite's magnetic field and, consequently, its auroras. Subsequently, in an analysis published in 2014, a study of water's thermodynamics and salt's effects was made. The results obtained indicate that Ganymede could have a stack of several ocean layers separated by different ice phases. All of this evidence proves that Ganymede's inner ocean could contain more water than all of Earth's oceans combined, and it could also be the biggest liquid water ocean in the entire solar system. This discovery not only fuels the flames of the search for extraterrestrial life, but also provides an invaluable source of water, an essential resource for sustainable space exploration, and a future colony on Jupiter's largest satellite. Currently, the astronomical community remains skeptical about the possible habitability of Ganymede's inner ocean, with many believing that while the inner ocean could be completely liquid, it would be too salty and cold to support any kind of life form like those on Earth. But other scientists speculate that if different conditions co-occur, Ganymede's inner ocean could be much less cold than previously thought, and then with warmer temperatures, life could emerge. Some of those factors are, the inner core of Ganymede is still found active enough to produce underwater volcanoes. These types of volcanoes exist on Earth. They are a source of heat for the species of underwater animals that inhabit the ocean floor. If such volcanoes also exist on Ganymede, then the areas near the volcano could be hot enough for life to emerge. Another factor that could contribute to the warming of Ganymede's inner ocean is the tidal forces exerted by giant Jupiter. If the gravitational forces that Jupiter exerts on Ganymede stretch and compress the satellite as it completes an orbit, the energy produced by these forces would be so great that it would warm the internal ocean a little, increasing its temperature by several hundred degrees, enough for living beings to live there without freezing to death. Be that as it may, it is currently unclear whether Ganymede's inner ocean is habitable, so the only way to find out will be to send a more specialized mission to explore it from the surface. A future of Ganymede for humanity Currently, there is no space mission studying Ganymede, and it is not because getting to Ganymede is very difficult. Sending a spacecraft to Jupiter is difficult, but we've already done it. We don't have a spacecraft orbiting Ganymede yet because everything we know about this satellite is relatively recent. The missions planned decades ago were aimed at studying the planets, not the satellites of those planets. The Juno space mission currently orbiting Jupiter manages to capture some images of Ganymede when it is close to the satellite, providing valuable information about its poles and surface. But as of this video's creation date, no space mission has been put into orbit around Ganymede, much less has there been one that has landed on its surface. 
The first mission to orbit Ganymede is expected to be the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer Space Mission, or JUICE mission for its acronym. JUICE was launched on April 14, 2023 from the French Guiana Space Center by the European Space Agency ESA. The JUICE mission is scheduled to make its first flyby of Ganymede in 2031 and then enter the moon's orbit in 2032, meaning that the JUICE mission will reach its destination nine years after its launch. The reason? This spacecraft is one of the heaviest ever sent for the study of planets, weighing in at 6,070 kilograms or 13,380 pounds. Weighing so much, the mission must opt for a slower journey, consisting of more than 10 gravity assist maneuvers using Earth, Venus, Jupiter, and some of Jupiter's moons such as Callisto and Europa. The mission aims to thoroughly study the Ganymede satellite and assess its potential to host life. Scientists now know that there is an ocean beneath the surface of Ganymede, and this mission will help us better understand the structure of the ocean, what temperatures it might have, what compounds it has, and most importantly, whether the internal ocean is habitable. When the JUICE spacecraft consumes all its fuel, it will be redirected to impact directly on the surface of Ganymede in February 2034. This maneuver will be similar to the one performed with the Cassini probe when it was slammed into Saturn once it ran out of fuel. This is done to study celestial bodies until the last second. Also impacting the JUICE probe against Ganymede could help us better understand how its layers and tenuous atmosphere are formed. As you can see throughout history, since we began to study the outer solar system and Jupiter's moons, we have been learning new things, and there is more and more interest in understanding what is in these planet-sized satellites. But now, space agencies still have difficulty reaching these places so far from Earth. Could it be that the JUICE mission is the one that finally finds traces of life in Ganymede? Would you like to know more about this fascinating space mission arriving in Ganymede in nine years? Let us know what you think in the comments.